Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, I have my good friend Chris Terrell back for another episode. I introduced him on episode 429, where we talked about five frugal hobbies. And I think that convinced more than a couple of you, both with strategy board games and pickleball. More interestingly, as Chris is a avid, avid pickleball player. And today he's back. And I suspect this is going to be the second of many episodes because we have so many interesting things to talk about. But we're talking today of you've reached Phi. And what does it look like to make that adjustment? What does life after Phi look like? Chris left his job in April of 2020, which of course, as we all know, was a pretty interesting time to do so amidst the start of the COVID pandemic. But preparing for Phi is a multi-year journey, truly. And we've talked about that many times here on the podcast that you need to prepare for this. This is not just a zero or one situation of, oh, I've hit a number on a screen. I'm going to stop working and expect my life to be roses and kittens and unicorns. It doesn't work that way. And Chris has just a really interesting perspective on this. So really excited for this episode. With that, welcome to Choose FI. Brad, thanks so much for having me back. Really looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, Chris, I am super excited for this. I think this is such a critical conversation because I think a lot of people, especially when they first get into FI, they get so excited about, about the numbers and rightfully so to some degree, right? It's, hey, for the first time you have a little space financially, you maybe eventually get to that point where you have some freedom, you have that, that elusive FU money, right? The, uh, the freedom unlimited money as Jonathan always used to joke and you have that power and it feels good. And I think people then kind of extrapolate that to, oh, this is just about the numbers and oh, won't my life be so fantastic when I hit that dollar figure that denotes I'm at five, whatever that means to you, 25 times your annual expenses, 30, 33 times, whatever it may be. But it really, it doesn't quite work that way. That, that becomes part of this journey, obviously, but it's such a small part. It's really the psychological aspect. And, and that's what I'm really excited to talk to you about tonight. Yeah, uh, you summed it up so well. I sort of think of it this way. Imagine if you would going on this great trip and you had this trip planned long in advance. And so there's this anticipation, there's this excitement that's built around it. And then the trip happens and it's wonderful, but there are things you did not expect. You can't anticipate everything that happens. And the same is true for Phi. You're going to get there and things are going to change. So what I'm hoping we'll have the opportunity to talk about today is helping people anticipate what those adjustments may look like for them in retirement. Yeah. And I think adjustments are important. And one of the things that I've found is you're constantly adjusting the best laid plans, right? Like you can have all these plans, you can do the work, but life throws you curveballs. And that's not a bug, maybe not a feature necessarily, but it's just, it is part of the lived experience. And we need to understand that, that, hey, your wants and desires are going to change. Your life circumstances are going to change. So I think the concept of having some set in stone plan, no matter what you conceptualize it as, it's just, that's not the reality of how things work. So it's important to lay this psychological groundwork of, hey, what's the toolbox of mental skills that I need to succeed at Phi? And Chris, that maybe sound a, a little kind of funny or counterintuitive to succeed at Phi, because we're talking about succeeding at that point once you've reached Phi, not to get to that number. Exactly. I have a friend who also early retired, although he wouldn't have described it as a Phi path, but he realized that he could be done a little earlier than some people. And one of the things that I told him that I hope really resonated with him is that when you reach Phi, it's just like you said, it's not unicorns and puppies every single day. Your life is going to still be your life. And while most of your days are wonderful, it is a huge adjustment because you have been in the working world for decades and all of a sudden that changed and flipped on a dime. And now what? So when you reach the end of your working journey, a lot of things are going to change, specifically that daily routine. Your nine to five just disappears overnight. And that's not the only thing that changes. Your working relationships are going to come to an end as well. Because at the end of the day, what brings people together at work most of the time is the work itself. 
Now, some people do have relationships with people they work with outside of work, but the vast majority of those relationships are the work itself. And there's also a certain level of status that can come from work itself as well. When I used to work for a law firm, I worked with attorneys that were working well into their mid-70s. And I asked myself, why would these people still be doing this when money is no longer the issue? These were partners. They were very wealthy people and did not need the money at this point. But what they would be walking away from was the status and power that come from being a high-level attorney in the city of Richmond. And the moment they retire, they become just another guy at the golf course. And I think that keeps a lot of people in the working world still in the working world longer than they might because they have so much of their identity wrapped up in who they are as a person at work. Yeah, I think that's a a pretty common thing that I've also noticed anecdotally, of course. But yeah, I mean, how do you start building your identity well before that point? Or maybe a more appropriate question is, how do you not build your identity around your job. I think that's what a lot of us have to figure out. And I think people in the fight community are, are in broad terms, pretty good at that in terms of it's the old, like, so what do you do question? How do you respond to that? Right. Is it, is it the reflexive, oh, I'm a CPA and I work for KPMG or is it, oh, <laughs> what do I do for fun? Do I play pickleball? Do I play strategy board games? Like what's your reflexive answer to that? And uh, so you obviously talk to a lot of people in the five community or getting started. I know you've spoken with a number of your friends about this. Like, how do you talk about that identity? What I like to tell them is it's going to take a certain level of planning and not everybody is a planner at heart. There are a lot of people that are reacting in the moment, either because they haven't developed that skill yet, or life is just coming at them so fast and so hard that they don't have the opportunity to look ahead. I'm sure you know lots and lots of people that are that are in the middle of a very involved career and are raising kids. And if you ask them, so what does Phi look like for you? They'll say, I just don't even have time to think about that. The money, like you said, that's the easy part, putting together a spreadsheet and figuring out, OK, I'm at 25 X what I need and I'm done. That's simple. But figuring out what you're going to do afterwards is going to take a level of planning and you need to get in front of that. For me, it was a little bit easier because my wife is about a decade older than I am. I got to see her experience life 10 years ahead of when I would reach that point. And that made me a planner by default in so many aspects of our lives. And so I have an innate advantage that maybe others don't have. But I'm telling you, you're going to need to start planning for this. Because when you stop working, you go from 60 to zero overnight. And so you're going to want to have a plan for that. And I think that I would start with, what do you want to do when you retire? Sometimes people tell me, I just want to stop working. That's not a great answer, truth be told, at the end of the day. It's a valid answer. Getting away from a terrible job is a reason all unto itself. But that's only going to sustain you for a short period of time. And then you're going to hit the now what? It isn't going to make you happy. It's going to make you not unhappy that you're at work. So having the opportunity to be in the FI world opens up lots of doors. And I would say to that person, think about what doors you want to open, because now you have the opportunity that you have been imagining all this time. Yeah. And as we know, the path to five for most of us is not an overnight thing, right? It's minimum. You're talking 10, 15 years for most people. So they've had time to think in general about phi. But like you're talking about, what do you want to do? Because as you're saying, and I would echo you in that, okay, stopping working, there's validity to that, right? Especially if it's a negative situation. It, it goes back way back to one of our earliest episodes with the happy philosopher, where he talked about alligators and kittens. And clearly, it's like this, uh, this look at what's in your life. And clearly, you want to get rid of all the alligators, the negative things that are just severely impacting you negatively before you focus on, hey, let's add some more of those happy little kittens into our lives. But rest assured, those kittens are really important. And I think that's, that's what you're saying of what doors do you want to open? 
And you really need to think about that and and maybe even start exploring that. Not maybe. (laughs) You clearly want to start exploring that before you get to five. Because I think, Chris, the biggest point that I would like to get across is if you wait until the day you reach that mythical number on a spreadsheet to start thinking about this, you are five to 10 years too late. That doesn't mean you're going to fail at Phi, but you might have that empty feeling for a while of, wow, I worked all this time and now this, like there's nothing that great, but that's, I think, because you missed a fundamental step that this is not just about the money. It's not just about the spreadsheet. It's about designing a life that you want to live into. And I think that's, if I could get one point across, that would be the one. And to build on your point, I can remember when I was still heavily into the golfing world, which I'm not so much anymore. But when I was, I was at a country club where a number of people that I golfed with were entering retirement. And the thing that stuck with me back then, this was probably 15 years ago, was they would tell me that that first year of retirement was really difficult for them. And these were not five people. These were people that were retiring at 63, 65, 68, whenever. And it was hard because they were describing that their sense of purpose and their sense of time structure had evaporated. And making that adjustment was really, really difficult for them. So while we may be talking about this in a phi sense, it's true of anybody that goes through retirement. It's a huge change in your life. And since phi people are being a lot more deliberate about what their post-working world looks like, they need to spend the time thinking about, well, okay, what does my post-working world look like? And I think one of the things that I'd like to start with is that there is going to be a lot of time for hobbies. And Lord knows I have a ton of hobbies, <laughs> but hobbies all by itself aren't necessarily going to give you a sense of purpose. And the good news is you're going to have 16 unstructured hours every day to figure out what is bringing purpose into your life. Yeah, that's a great starting point. So sense of purpose. And that's not to say, of course, that every one of those 16 hours is going to be this this highly optimized sense of purpose. I think, you know, because I, I, I'd say that dripping with sarcasm and that clearly was not your intention at all. But I think I think one of the potential pitfalls and perils of just the FI mindset generally is over-optimizing. Absolutely. And this is, right, like this is something that we all fall prey to. And it's because we have so many of these, I think, admirable qualities and these long-term planning, and we clearly understand the numbers and we're looking at like, what does this look like in an optimized way? And then it kind of it bleeds into other aspects. So you might start getting, and, and this is what I try to counsel against, is any type of phi keeping up with the Joneses, which is like, you have a 65% savings rate, I have a 67% savings rate. Like, you know, that's the same mentality as the, hey, my neighbor got a Mercedes or a BMW 3 Series, so I got a BMW 5 Series, right? So I don't see all that much of it, but it does happen. And I think that sense of purpose, it's also like, okay, let's find some balance. And I suspect that very obviously is, is how you come down on this in terms of that sense of purpose is critical. But if I'm just thinking about optimizing those 16 hours, then I'm probably starting from the wrong position. I would agree 100%. 16 hours a day, every day, 24-7 is a lot of time to fill. (laughs) And I would offer to somebody getting ready to enter the retired world that it is perfectly okay to move at a slower pace once you retire because All of a sudden, all that time you dedicated to work, and it was more than just the hours you were at work. There was the preparing for work. There was the commute to work. There was the time you were thinking about work when you were supposed to be with your loved one, but you had that deadline coming up tomorrow and you just couldn't get your mind off of that. All of those things go away and suddenly you have 16 times seven, what is that? That is 112 unstructured hours per week, assuming you sleep a full eight hours a night. You're not going to fill 112 hours a week. You're going to have some downtime. And a good friend of mine once described her perfect world is having some time to just be, to have quiet time, to enjoy that coffee on the patio, and to have time to think. 
And I would certainly offer that one of the things that I did not expect when I entered FI was the ability to simply think and concentrate on things that I did not know I had the time for when I was working. Nice. Okay, give me some examples. That sounds amazing. Well, you get to become more of a philosopher in your life. You get to think about life's bigger questions and actually devote some time to it. And you can do research on it if you want to. You can have conversations with people. You just have the bandwidth to explore concepts and ideas that you didn't realize you didn't have the bandwidth for before. That's cool. Yeah, that uh, downtime is just so critical. And I think myself as a naturally more introverted person in the sense that I get energy from that downtime. It's just, it has become so critical to me. And I think I sometimes overlook it or don't really prioritize it as much as I need to. So that time to just be is, is such an important part of that 112 weeking hours. Let, let's use that number. I love that. And I love that you did the math on the fly like that. That was very impressive, Chris. But okay, I want to talk more about the 112 weeking hours, but let's go back because I, I kind of hijacked your point on the sense of purpose. And I don't think you were able to, to really fully illustrate where you were going with that because I was talking about not over-optimizing a sense of purpose. But let's take a step back and actually talk about that sense of purpose first because I think, I think this is what so many people I know in my parents' generation that I talk to about like, oh, why would you ever want to retire? Wouldn't you be bored? Wouldn't, what would you do? What, don't you get value from working or earning money or all these things. And like, I mean, I guess obviously you get value from earning money. I never got value or a sense of purpose from my work in and of itself. So like that never resonated with me or like, oh, won't you be bored? What are you going to fill that time with? And that also is something that I would dispel. I suspect we'll, we'll talk about this later, but I have no problem filling those 112 waking hours. In fact, that's like the opposite <laughs> of my problem at this point. But yeah, I'd love to hear you talk more about sense of purpose. Sure. So when I first retired, I had no problems filling that 112 hours, like you said. But what I hadn't really fleshed out yet because I didn't have the opportunity was, okay, I'm going to enjoy some hobbies and I'm going to enjoy some travel, but there has to be more to it than just that. And like you said, when I was in the working world, I worked in IT for 25 years, among other earlier careers. And while I felt like I did good work and it was needed work and I was valued in my workplace, I didn't feel like I was doing anything that was going to be remembered when I was gone from work. It was just somebody being a mid to high level worker bee at a couple of nice places to work. It's not terribly satisfying, but I did have the opportunity when I was there to help bring other people into IT. And when I, when people ask me, what are you most proud of when you were at your accounting firm? I always come back to the story of hiring the company gopher to work for the IT team, even though she had no IT experience whatsoever, because she already knew our culture and we could train her in IT. And now she's built this great career for herself. And now that I'm retired and I have the opportunity to help other people start with their careers by mentoring them, that gives me a lot of sense of purpose. I have the opportunity to help people with their IT. I teach people how to play pickleball. I help people understand FI better and to become someone that can convey that education that I've received over time. What little wisdom I've managed to accumulate over 56 years that really does feel good. Like I now I really feel like I am making a difference in the world. Yeah. And I can feel like the energy, the positive energy exuding from you when you talk about that. Like there's that that little extra smile on your face. And the through line to all of that is teaching, which is actually really, really cool. And I think what I would counsel to everyone listening is look for those areas in your life that you just find yourself enjoying that maybe even unexpectedly you find as like a flow state or just, hey, that's the hour I look forward to or the couple hours I look forward to every week. Or in your case, hey, even looking back, I'm not sure exactly how long ago it was that you hired, hired that woman to join your IT department, probably five, 10 plus years ago. And 
you still look back on that as one of the high points in your life. And that's, that's a really incredible thing that, wow, that stuck out. And I actually have a, a kind of funny one on the face of it. But the nice part is none of this, it, it, it's not funny. It's just, it, it is what it is that you enjoy. And, and I think that's okay. Like I've found, I actually am the coach of my younger daughter's volleyball team. Okay. And I have never formally played volleyball. I always played as a kid. I was, a, you know, I was a pretty good athlete, so I, I could always pick up most sports reasonably well. And, and I just, I love playing volleyball. If it wasn't during soccer season, I, I would have played on the, the school team. But anyway, I have no formal training in volleyball, certainly. But that, I think, isn't what you need to be a good coach. I think what you need is the ability to help kids get excited about a sport and help them improve their skills. And not only do you have the opportunity to coach now, but because you have so much free time now, you have the opportunity to coach well. It's not just a plus one that you've added on to your already busy life of working and maintaining a family. Right. Yeah, that is exactly like I have the time to do this. And I actually like, I guess the very long story short, I could go into my whole uh, my whole explanation on uh, how I think best to teach kids and all these things. And I do believe me, because I could we could probably spend a half hour on that. I think it would actually be somewhat interesting. But suffice to say, this hour of coaching volleyball every Sunday is the best hour that I have every week of the 112. If I could line up one hour there's a high probability that that volleyball coaching is going to be the number one on each of those eight weeks of the season. And I just love it. That's so very cool. And you have the time to appreciate that part of your life as well. And when you recognize these things, you start to lean into them more. Yes, exactly. And that, that's the point for, for this conversation is, hey, look for those things. And maybe there are ways that you can augment that in your life, right? Exactly. I think one other thing that really crystallized for me over the past two years, and like you mentioned, I've been in the FI world now for about three years, but it started in the middle of pandemic and everything was just a little nuts for that first year, especially from the socialization standpoint. You know, we were, a lot of us were cocooned because we could afford to be and needed to be during that time. But once we started coming back out into the regular world again, I had the opportunity to step back and have a conversation with myself that said, you have a lot of relationships. I'm an extrovert by nation. I'm kind of an off the chart extrovert by <laughs> nature. But 112 hours, like you said, is actually a limited amount of time. Which of these relationships in my life do I really want to invest in and which ones am I going to not completely cut out, but simply not devote the time to that I wanted to? And it's a really wonderful opportunity when you're in the FI world to pick out the relationships that are most important to you and really hone in on those. And it takes it to a different level, a really meaningful level. And for me, I developed that sense of connection that I simply didn't have the time or bandwidth for the concentration level for when I was in the working world. And that was an unexpected thing. And I would counsel anybody to really think about that. Who are the people you want in your life post work? Yeah. It's this weird kind of, uh, I don't know if paradox is the right word, but you have all of these hours, you have those 112 hours a week, right? Obviously times 52. And you have people in your life who you want to be closer with, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that there is that finite amount of time and you are going to find yourself filling those hours. So I think like you're saying, finding those relationships you want to invest in, and that doesn't mean cutting out everybody else in your life, but you have to be realistic. Like I even think in terms of as silly as this is with the math of like, if I had two phone calls a week, two hour long phone calls a week with friends, which would be a lot. I mean, how many people in a given week are having two one hour phone calls with friends? Too few. Right. Yeah. Very, very few. And so that's 104 of those calls a year. And again, that's not going to happen, mind you. But then, hey, that means there would be 104 different human beings one time a year, which is not enough to keep up a relationship. So you just simply do the math and you're like, oh, wow, if I talk to that person once every four months, once every third of a year, 
okay, we're now down to 30 people that I could possibly do that with. And again, with the understanding that this is totally unrealistic and nobody's going to have two phone calls a week, but okay. Then you say realistically, all right, if I wanted to invest, right? Like for you, you have your board game group. Okay. That's friends time. And I maybe have three, four, five other people who I see on a monthly basis or maybe twice a month basis. And then you get down to, all right, look, that's maybe what this looks like. I have these five close friends who I see, who I play pickleball with. And in your case, you can expand it out, right? You probably have a handful of friends you play pickleball with, a handful of friends you play strategy board games with, and the pinball people, et cetera. But then, okay, there's some people I can keep up with on a maybe once a year kind of call or something like that. And, and I'm, I'm rambling here, Chris, obviously, but I think it's important for people to think about how many relationships can I have? What would it look like to keep up with people who do I want to keep up with people? This is not us prescribing. You should only have seven friends. Obviously, we're not we're not talking about that at all. But hey, what's realistic in the confines of your life? I think that's ultimately what I'm trying to get across. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. You really do have to be realistic about that. I will say that when I started having this discussion with myself, one thing that was important for me was I discovered that I really wanted to surround myself with people who were more optimistic in their outlook on things. And I think that the Phi world is incredibly optimistic by nature because anybody that's looking at Phi is looking at reaching a better place in their life. They're looking to the future and saying, wow, look at the possibility, look at the potential. Or they've reached Phi and now they hopefully get to say, this is exactly what I had in mind. And in my case, when people ask me what it's like not to be working anymore, I have to be a little guarded if they're still in the working world, because the reality is, oh, I couldn't imagine going back to what you're doing right now. It's just <laughs> so much better on the other side. Yeah. yeah, I guess that would kind of be a, uh, a conversation killer right there. Yeah, right so you don't. So. <laughs> Relationship killer more than conversation killer. Right. You have to be just a little bit guarded about that and play it down a little and just say, oh, I'm keeping very busy. I'm filling those 112 hours. I may not be in the working world, but I'm still just as busy. And that's relatable at that point. What I don't say is I'm doing the things that I want to do rather than doing the things that I needed to do. Yeah, exactly. Although if I were to add on, I actually am doing the things that I need to do. I just need different things now. Ooh, Ooh that's, a, that's a quote for the ages. I like that, guys. Yeah, you do need different things. And I think, right, the priorities become different. And I'm even thinking, so this is a, a much more micro level, obviously, but even just the amount of time, like what you need to do. And, and when you first approach that, it's, not a negative sense necessarily, but there are practical realities of life. And for most of us, that means buying things for the house, going shopping, and, and all these other day-to-day -day necessities. And I think one of the other benefits of Phi and just owning your time, maybe more so than even Phi, is you can do those things on your own schedule. And I think just how critical that is, like I was talking to someone recently, I think it was even my mom, who was saying like, oh, isn't isn't Costco always crowded? I always hear these horror stories. I'm like, well, yeah, if you go Saturday at 2 p.m., there's going to be an hour long line. Like Laura's response was, if you get there, yeah, they, they say they open at whatever. I forget exactly. They say they open at 10, but the secret is they're really open at 945. If you're there, there's going to be five people in the store, right? So that's a very different experience. So the compounding benefits of Phi are by living on your own schedule, you actually reclaim many, many hours a week from those standard necessities of what people doing the same task, but by necessity and by definition of when they have the time to do it, that's when everybody else has the time to do it. And it's much less efficient. Right. One of the things that I had to quickly adjust to when I entered the world of Phi was that days of the week no longer matter. And since they don't, and I've been going to Costco since they were Price Club, so it's been <laughs> nice. way back when. Oh my gosh, 35 years probably at this point. I absolutely love everything that Costco does. They treat their employees well, and I love their concept. We could spend a half hour just on Costco. Mm -hmm. But where I'm going with this is that, like you said, Costco can be pretty miserable on a Saturday or Sunday because that's when everybody is there. 
And they are busy during the week, surprisingly busy during the week. But I do go on a Tuesday or a Wednesday at 10 o'clock, and it really is much different. And it makes everything a lot more pleasant when you're at Costco. I enjoy being at Costco during the week. I was surprised to see how many people were there. So I researched a few numbers before our episode today, and I discovered that one out of six Americans are 65 or older. And they are at Costco on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 11 (laughs) o'clock. It looks like an AARP gathering at Costco on a Tuesday or Wednesday. They are there, but they've figured out the same things that the five people have figured out as well. They're like, this is the time to be there. Don't come on a Saturday or Sunday. The other thing that I'll lean into just a little bit about that AARP experience is one thing when you reach Phi is it's going to feel just a little bit lonely sometimes because if you reach it at an earlier age, especially if you reach it in, let's say, your late 30s, 40s, early 50s, I was 53 when I reached Phi, which is going to seem wonderful to some people, but going to seem dreadfully late to others, is that very few people actually get out of the working world by age 53. Only 5% do. I went to the Financial Samurai's website and discovered that only 1% of people retire before age 50 and 5% of people are retired by age 54. And that's one of the things that I really noticed is that I'm not seeing a lot of people my age during the week. They are out there and luckily a lot of them play pickleball. (laughs) And it's funny because that's exactly where I was going to go with that, which is Okay, at some point then, especially when you invest in your health, which I know is another aspect of of something you wanted to talk about here, age becomes truly just a number, right? And and I, I think to a large degree, it is just a number anyway, but you're 56, you said. And that in a prior generation, I think somebody who's 56 would chalk themselves up to being past it, over the hill, oh, my knees, I couldn't possibly play. And you just have all these self-limiting beliefs. I have a picture of my grandparents when I was first born in 1966, and they are my age now. And I loved my grandparents to death, and they looked old in that picture because in 1966, 56 was older. You know, medicine isn't as it is today. You couldn't just go over to Ortho, Virginia and get that knee problem taken care of like I've had done three times now on my right oh, knee. Wow. That sort of thing didn't exist to the same level. And my grandparents lived into their 80s and 90s respectively. But yeah, I look at that picture and I think I look nothing like that. And that's one of the beauties of Phi that I really want to stress to people who are not necessarily at their best point health-wise and they are still in their working careers, cut yourself a break. If you are focused on your family and you are focused on your career, there isn't 112 hours of unstructured time and something is going to give way. And for a lot of people, it's taking care of themselves. If you can find a way to get better shape, That's wonderful. But if you can't, give yourself a break because once you do reach that point, you're not going to retire on a Friday and hit the gym on a Monday (laughs) and do that four days a week. Most people won't. Maybe a few people will, but most people won't. But at some point, you'll step back and realize, wow, I can really invest in my health now. And for me, that took a full year after retirement. I was somewhat overweight most of my career that I worked in IT, not dramatically so. A 36 waist, I was always around like 196 pounds. Occasionally, it would drift over 200, and I would dial it back in because I was too cheap to buy other pants. (laughs) You know, wait a minute. If I'm eating all this food, I I cannot continue to buy more clothes and stay on this Phi lifestyle. No, I'm going to have to do this. But the reality is 196 was not a good weight for me. And when I retired, I looked back at all the things I wanted to do, and I'd actually drifted up to 208 at that point. It's like, wow, I need to do something about this. And that weight slowly started to come off that first year. And when I decided to actually do something about it, I joined Noom, which I highly recommend. They were great. They added some structure that I desperately needed. And I also teased out all of the bad habits that I had that I ultimately corrected. I went down from 198 back to my 170s, and I've drifted back up into my low 180s now, which is a good, healthy spot for me. 
where I'm going is you will have the time for this. And that's something you will want to get in front of because once you reach phi, that time to think that I described, you are suddenly going to be aware that there's a clock out there. Okay, now that I don't have to work, how many years do I have in front of me? And not just how many years, how many good years do you have in front of you? I'm 56 years old right now. And the reality is my best 20 years are in front of me, although I fully anticipate to live 40 more years based on my family history. We don't have a lot of medical problems in my family. Medicine's only going to get better. I take good care of myself. So there's no reason why I shouldn't reach my mid nineties, which is fantastic. I've got 40 years, but I shouldn't think about it as 40 years because between 56 and 58 is going to be better than between 94 and 96. So taking advantage of that real quality time that you suddenly have in front of you is going to become supremely important. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, such an important topic generally. And like you said, clearly cut yourself some slack as you so appropriately said to the people who are, if you're in the workforce, you have a busy life. Obviously you can always improve your health. That's one of just the mindsets of Phi is you can always improve period. Just fill in whatever blank at the end you want at the end of that. And Chris, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I mean, I look back at some pictures from even when I got married, I'm like, wow, I look dramatically worse. And I was in my mid twenties at that point. I'm 43 now. And I mean, I'm in such better shape. I'm so much healthier in every way, in every possible way. I think I was talking with Jonathan and cause actually Jonathan and I work out four times a week. Now we're talking about all these little like his dad asked him like a blanket question of like, how would I X? And it was like, get healthier or detox or like go through a, some type of uh, detox diet or something. I forget what the exact question was, but Jonathan's like, well, how much time do you have like to, for me to answer this? And, and that's almost where I go is I've made hundreds of little changes over the last 15 years, hundreds and hundreds of them. And they're all tiny. I can't point to any one dramatic one, I guess, other than the gym. I think the the case is closed at this point on on argument that strength training is is essential. That is a hill I will die on at this point. Like I know we we don't like to get into arguments about what's the best exercise I, because any type of exercise, any type of movement is important, but strength training is critically important. I think just hard stop end of story. But other than that, it's all of these little things and this Chris has been a a 15 year journey for me and that is the advice I would give to people is like you're saying time is finite. You know, we've, we've referenced so many times the Die With Zero book, the Wait But Why, the tail end article, which just shows you just very graphically how finite your life is. And I think just looking at my age, I'm almost 44, doubling that is 88. I mean, based on my family, I'd be pretty happy to, to get there. So by any definition, I'm halfway through. And as you're saying, the ages between 80 and 88 probably are maybe it might be a limiting belief, but those probably are not going to be as healthy as the next eight years. So, okay, how can I maximize that time? And I think being healthier and being fitter makes everything for me better from that volleyball. Like Molly, my little one likes to joke. She's like, daddy, you are sprinting around the entire hour because I'm like running after the volleyball and like quickly getting it back instead of just wasting the kid's time and slowly walking over to the ball, which I know this sounds so silly and such like a microcosm, but it's one of those things like, Chris, if you had asked me 20 years ago at almost 44, would I be sprinting after a volleyball a hundred times in an hour long practice? The answer obviously would have been no. I would have said, oh, I'd be over the hill at that point. There's no way I could do that. But I'm in as good a shape as I've ever been in, in my entire life. And the add-on benefits, I think we're, you know, we don't want to beat a dead horse here, but, but this is so important. Like the add-on benefits of being healthy and being fit and being strong and being agile, you just cannot overstate how important every aspect that is. And it adds such a level of positivity to your life as well. You simply feel good being in better shape now just changed my outlook on things. It really did. And it gave me it made me happy. It gave me more confidence. It was just better in every single way. And it helped me realize that I'm on this journey for the long haul and I only have one vehicle that's going to take me there and I better take care of it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and the way we got into this health conversation was you talking about there not being that many people your age around. And interestingly, I guess the immediate kind of argument to that is it doesn't matter. 
right? So you could go out on the pickleball court and even though you're 56, you could play with 20 and 30 year olds very, very easily. Well, A, because it's a skill-based game, but B, because you are very fit. Just period, hard stop, end of story. You're very fit. It doesn't matter. It's not for a 56-year-old, right? Like that qualifier, I think, goes away, at least how I see the modern the modern day human who's healthy and fit is like, I don't need to qualify. Like I'm really strong for like, I'm not qualifying that as for an almost 44 year old. Like, I think you go into the gym with me and like, I'm really strong, period, hard stop, end of story. Like, I don't need to qualify it. Right. And that, that feels really good. Yeah. When I play pickleball, when people say how you qualify that, well, I say, well, I play at a four or five. And I don't have to say I play at a four or five as a 55 plus. There is a little bit to that, but like you said, I can hang with a 30-year-old pretty much all day at a similar skill level because I've put myself back in better shape again. And when you're on the pickleball court, people don't think about age quite as much. I, in fact, I don't think they think about age at all. They're simply paying attention to where everybody's paddle is. Right, and exactly. That's a really gratifying feeling. And coming back to my grandparents, I couldn't imagine my grandparents being on the pickleball court. It's just... I look at that picture and say, that's just not where they were in their lives. Yeah, Chris, I, I hear you about certainly like you're saying about your grandparents. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the nice things about being where we are and where we all are in the five community is, is we can think about these things that are important to us. And, and we've talked obviously for quite some time now on, on health. And I think it's really important and I'm glad we spent the time. And I think another aspect that, that a lot of people prioritize in our community is volunteering and spiritual pursuits. And I'd love to hear you talk about this. Sure. One of the things that I personally am getting a lot of satisfaction from now is the opportunity to volunteer. I am doing some work with Virginia Voice in the RVA area that I didn't even know existed before FI. And that was one of those adaptations that you described. I have a few other volunteer opportunities as well. I'm on the board at Richmond Pinball Collective, which is an all-volunteer organization, which is a lot of fun. Someone that I have a lot of respect for, even though we're not in the same place spiritually, is a good friend of mine named Mike, who I just saw again over the weekend. Five years ago, he had retired a little bit early for some people, and he was not in the FI world. He had just done well for himself. And he and his wife, Lee, had come out to the Richmond area to do 18 months of volunteer work for their church. And I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. He left his full-time job and basically picked up another full-time job. And he told me there was a decent amount of stress involved with that. And pickleball was a fantastic outlet for him. But it was deeply meaningful for him. And he didn't have the bandwidth to do it for himself or for his church at that time. And for people listening that really want to devote more of themselves spiritually as they enter FI, my counsel would be, you are going to have those opportunities. And I don't know a single house of worship that isn't thrilled to have more people with more spare time to help devote to that cause. Yeah, agreed. I think, uh, right, to expand that is, any organization that doesn't want someone who is, I guess, had the wherewithal to get to five. Like you think about all the positive attributes that we, that we bring potentially to an organization and then you throw in, oh, and then they have all this time. So yeah, clearly for so many people, that spiritual side is important. And now you can focus on that. Like you said, volunteering, that could mean something very overt, like Habitat for Humanity is always like kind of where people's minds go to organizations, to soup kitchens, to, in your case, even something that you're just really interested in, right? The Pinball Collective. Exactly. Uh, you know, the Richmond Pinball Collective does not <laughs> sound like your typical volunteering organization, right. but we bring a lot of enjoyment to people's lives and I'm passionate about it. And it's a lot of fun. And I guess where I'd like to go with that is that when people think about donating to charity, there are two ways that you can do that. You can do that by writing a check, which works. Every organization needs money. But what every other organization also needs is time. And that time can be worth a lot more than money in some instances because time is not something you can write a check for. You can't just stroke a check and go, here's 50 hours of time. It doesn't work that way. If you're working for Habitat for Humanity, 
you are taking the time to help build structures. And my wife has done that to a limited degree. She has been involved with Habitat for Humanity and she gets a lot of satisfaction for that. And I have found that my old mindset was people that donated large sums of money were doing the best for charities. And I've sort of changed my thinking on that a little bit. I think the people that are giving their time are perhaps giving an even greater gift in some instances. Now, if somebody strokes a check for a million dollars, that goes a long way, obviously. <laughs> but donating $100 to NPR or donating eight hours of your time, well, if you value your time, if your time is worth, let's say, $30, $50 an hour, well, suddenly you've just donated $240, $400 an hour, depending on where your skill set lies. Yeah. I mean, you've hit it right on the head. I think just in terms of I volunteer as the treasurer of my daughter's swim team. And on the face of it, it's just a little summer swim team. That's how we think of it. But yet there are 180 swimmers. This is like when we have events, we have 300 plus swimmers showing up. This is like a pretty significant event that is all volunteer led just by really probably 15 to 20 people across all of the various aspects. And I spend a lot of time I mean, when I really, I sometimes, in fairness, I sometimes grumble about all the time that I'm spending on it, but it's really, really important because without those 15 or 20 people, these events wouldn't happen. This life experience that the kids are getting, like when my daughters look back at their childhood, the summer swim team at our local pool is going to be one of, if not the number one thing they look back on as the happiest moments of their childhood. And it just simply wouldn't happen without those people volunteering. There's no way I could cut a check, right? Like nobody would do my job as this treasurer and all the other things I do for even $5,000, right? Like, and I'm not like, it's just, it is invaluable. And obviously I have certain skills that I'm bringing to the table here and all the people that volunteer have their own skills. It, it's, it is astonishing to see. And again, this is the tiniest little microcosm, but when you think about how many of these organizations and similar organizations exist all across the country and world, like it's run on volunteers and you giving your time is just really, really, really important. So I know there's, there's lots of these things, Chris, that I would love to get involved in. But again, you need to really balance, like, what can I realistically do? And I think that's, that's kind of the larger meta issue that I would love to get across to people. And I think we've done a pretty good job with it is, okay, 112 hours a week sounds like a lot, but it can also go pretty quickly. And you need to be very judicious with that time and not not over schedule, because I, I know like I look at like the tyranny of my calendar is how I like kind of jokingly call it. And like having things on the calendar sometimes is is tough because you do want some level of unstructured time. Yeah, exactly. That unstructured time is going to be important because everybody needs a reset. Even in the FI world, I think sometimes people have the notion that when you're not working anymore, whether you retired via FI or not. You have a clear head 100% of the time and you don't need downtime. And that is 100% not true. You absolutely Agreed. have to have those reset times and you have to bake that in. I think it's very easy to get overscheduled. And I know that I am tiptoeing up to that line. And my wife would probably emphasize that point, <laughs> especially right now. There are a few extra things I've taken on recently and she's starting to give me that look like, okay, if you've added this to your life, what are you going to cut back on a little bit? And that's a wonderful problem to have at the end of the day. But you still have to pay attention to where those hours are going. You know, I need to spend quality time with the missus. Absolutely. And you also need to be cognizant of, okay, if she's having those thoughts, then, then maybe tiptoeing up to that line might actually be having stepped over the line. You think maybe just a little bit? Yeah, I think she would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, let, let's really drill in on this. So how do you decide? So you said you've added a couple things recently. Now, I think one of the arts of kind of life in general is maybe saying no to things because right. we all have a lot of inbound, right? We have a lot of just all these things that we can do, but deciding what you're going to do with those 16 hours a day 
is an altogether different scenario, right? So like, okay, let's talk that just these couple things you added recently. Like, how did you decide that amongst all the things you could do, which is, hey, I could spend more time with my wife, I could play more pickleball, I could play, you do whatever, all these fun things, I could sit and read, I could sit and think, these couple of things that you just added, that they were over that, whatever this bar is that, hey, I need to clear this before I decide this is something I want to add to my life. Right. I'd say that there are a couple of internal barometers you should be paying attention to. If you are in a relationship and you start to get that look from your significant other, that's a pretty good hint that maybe you have tiptoed over that line. And and in my case, I like I said, I may have done that recently and I'm going to need to look at something I spend a little less time on. I think the other thing that you really hit on was the tyranny of the calendar. Recently, I have found myself waking up thinking, okay, I've got this at nine and this at 1030 and this at one and this at three and this at five. And it's starting to feel like a chore at this yeah. point. It's not as enjoyable as it was because it's just become a little too busy. And those five things can all be enjoyable things unto themselves. But when it starts to feel like too much, it's probably too much. And I think everybody has their own sense of what too much is. That 112 hours for one person, that might be, I'm going to be go, go, go for 80 hours a week. And for another person, it might be 32. And the one thing I'd really like to stress is whatever that number is, that's individual and you don't have to explain it to anybody. What feels good for you feels good for you. And I think that some of the better things that happen in life, like volunteering and whatnot, that all develops organically. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I think, I think you also will just figure this out on the fly. And I, and I think that goes back to what I said way at the beginning of the episode is none of this is set in stone. That's just not the way we work. That's not the way humanity works. That's not the way the world works in that everything is constantly changing. And that means down to, hey, what am I looking to get out of my week or out of my month or out of my year or out of my life, right? That is going to change. And I mean, even Chris, just down to like that calendar, which is, okay, I told you I, I work out four days a week with Jonathan, right? So it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So we're actually recording this on a Wednesday. So Wednesday is the one day that I, that I don't have that on my schedule. So naturally I think, okay, this is the perfect day for recording. And that has always been my thought. But now I'm thinking, oh, maybe Wednesday would be the perfect day to not schedule anything and just have it as a wide open day as opposed to, oh, that's the logical because I have time on those days as opposed to saying, oh, well, maybe if I get home at 930 every day from the gym, those four days, maybe I record at 11 o'clock or 1130, give myself a little bit of buffer to kind of recuperate. And then it's just I'm kind of doubling up on one given day. And then I have that entire free day just to do whatever, because as it stands now, I don't have any major time gap, especially with my kids getting home, let's say three o'clock or thereafter. Like I don't have that many hours in a row ever where I just have totally unstructured time. So I think that's one kind of aha moment I've had recently. So this may be one of the last times I ever record on a Wednesday possibly, which is kind of cool that I've thought through, okay, I thought that was a good idea. I experimented with it. It made sense, but oh, maybe I have a better thing to try and we'll see what happens. Exactly. Exactly. And if there's one more thing I can put into the potential for somebody's 112 hour week that we haven't touched on is the idea of actually doing a little paid work. Hmm. The notion that you leave the working world and you never make another dime the rest of your life that's not terribly satisfying for everybody. And I can tell you that for the first year, especially in the middle of the pandemic, I had zero part-time work. But over time, I started taking on a little part-time work. And a year ago, I picked up some IT consulting work, which is about 10 to 15 hours a month, which isn't a whole lot, but it really scratches an itch that I kind of knew was still there in that there is still a part of me that likes being in the working world, that likes making a little F you money, that mm -hmm. just enjoys being around people and enjoys being helpful. When I tell people that go into IT, and usually you start at help desk, I tell them the most important 
trait you can have for being a help desk worker is to be freaking helpful. You just <laughs> need to be helpful first. Even if you don't know the answer to the problem, be helpful and people appreciate that. And I've always enjoyed that aspect of my job is that I enjoy helping people. So going in and solving problems and getting paid for it, <laughs> I've enjoyed that, but I only take the work I want to do. And that's so much fun in FI. I actually have five different ways I make money now, including IT consulting. Wow. I teach pickleball. I do a few other things as well. I'm not going to go down all these <laughs> different rabbit holes, but it's not a whole lot of time. A couple of these things I only do for a few hours a week. I do a little bit of professional voice work at this point, but it's not a big sum of money and I don't have to devote a lot of time to it, but I really enjoy the work when I get it. There can be that as well. So for people who don't necessarily want to step away completely from work, don't work if it feels good. Yeah. And I suspect the vast majority of people will make money in retirement or FI almost invariably. I, I can't think of anybody that I really know that has made zero dollars after reaching FI. Right. Right. It's pretty rare. And but I, I think you approach it so wonderfully in the sense like you're talking about solving problems. Right. So do you really want to be doing IT work after you retired from that? Well, maybe not the mundane part of it. And you're certainly not going to meetings or, you know, filing TPS reports or anything. But if you get to solve problems and you help somebody and you get paid in the process, OK, th that sounds like a different proposition entirely. Exactly. I am going to be in Charlottesville tomorrow because the client I'm working with is redoing a space and they need somebody to come in and look at it from a technical side and figure out how best to configure some things. And that, that for me is just fun. That's just another puzzle. Yeah. That may as well be a game at that point. <laughs> and they're going to be, they should be happy with the end result if I do my job correctly. And then it's just a win-win for everybody. And then they're going to give me some money for that. Fantastic. But to the point I want to stress one more time is if you don't need the money, do the work that you enjoy doing. Don't work because you feel like you should be working. Do the work that actually brings meaning into your life. Yeah, I love it, Chris. And uh, it certainly seems like, as we've talked about, teaching is a big aspect of, of the things that you enjoy. And I love to see that you're teaching pickleball and, and helping coach people. And I know I've experienced that firsthand and you're a marvelous, marvelous instructor. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, this has been fun. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on? Or I, I mean, obviously, we could probably spend another five hours just kind of shooting the breeze about this. But I think we talked about a lot of like the potential pitfalls or struggles and the things that people really need to think about. But any final words or, or last things you wanted to talk about? So, Brad, if I were to summarize our conversation today, I think I would start with that as you approach FI, it's going to be a big change and it's good to start getting in front of that now and really think about what do I want my life to look like as I get into FI. And that you're going to have a lot of unstructured time and it is going to be an adjustment for everyone, even the people who have planned and being deliberate about what you want to do and then adjusting on the fly when life comes at you from different angles is a wonderful opportunity and embrace it. That is beautiful. Embrace it. Indeed. Chris, thank you so much. This was a really fun conversation. Greatly appreciate it. And I look forward to certainly a part three and beyond in the future. Oh, Brad, this was so much fun today. I really look forward to coming back.